take your love away. You will always be more than enough for me.
Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Oh, you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy. place to build your life and build it strong than on Jesus. People search, people all over the world search for the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? You'll never find your meaning for this life 
outside of Jesus. It's not ever going to happen because he is life. He is love. And he is the foundation upon which every human life should be built on. Jesus died for the entire human race, all of humanity. And so whether you're here in this room or you're watching online, and you say, man, I, I just want peace in my life. You'll never have it without Jesus. I just want, I just want rest in my life. You'll never have it without Jesus. I, I, I just... I just want to know why I'm in this life. You'll never know without him. You can't because he is the one whereby the world's were framed. He is the word. He is God who put on flesh, who came into this earth, who lived a sinless life and then died for the sinful, which was all of humanity. Some of you may think, you know what? I was born in a Christian family. I grew up in church. I've been in church my entire life. That puts me good with God. Now that don't put you anywhere, but in a church all your life. If you've never accepted what Jesus did on the cross for you, you're as lost as the junkie sleeping on the sidewalk. Now, a lot of people don't like hearing that, but it's the truth. Because you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for you, that He was raised to life for you, you confess that with your mouth and the Bible says you are saved. Not because you've been in church your entire life. Not because your grandmother was a saintly woman. No, because you make the decision to trust what God has done for you. That's the beauty of God. He created everything. And then he gave his creation the choice whether they would choose him or not. I hear people say, God's a mean God and God's like a dictator and, and God, who, how could you serve a God that would let this, that, and the other happen? How could you serve a God who would send people to hell? So I don't serve a God that sends people to hell. I serve a God who gave people the opportunity to not go there and then he left it up to them to choose. No, I serve a God who's so amazing that he gives each individual the choice to choose him or deny him. People who deny him do not go to heaven. And people that deny him do not experience the awesomeness of God this side of heaven. But you can if you so choose. And the choice is not up to God. He made his. <laughs> and now it's time for some of you to make yours. Whether you're in this room or you're watching online and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus like that. I have a knowing of Jesus, but I don't really know him. And right there where you're at in this room or watching online, you say, man, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to accept what Jesus has done for me. And if that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer to connect with God. It's, it's as simple as connecting with Him by faith. 
It's that simple. So if you're in this room and you say, that's me. Come on, would you just put your hand up and say, come on, preacher. Will you lead me in a prayer today to connect with God? And if you're watching online and you say, it's me. You can't see me, though. You can't see me. I can't see you, but God can see you. I don't have to be able to see you. God sees you and he sees the intent of your heart. So right there where you're at, trust him. You say, but I'm not in church. It doesn't matter that you're not in this room. What matters is you understand you need Jesus in your life and now you're willing to make the choice to receive him. That's what matters. Come on, right there where you're at. Everybody in this room, help them pray. Say, Heavenly Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I accept and I receive forgiveness for my sin. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sin. I believe that he's raised from the dead. And I believe he is my savior. I declare him as my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, church, you ought to celebrate a little. Amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer online, there'll be a, a something come up on your screen. I don't know what they call it. Anyway, you'll see it. You can connect with us. We want to help you in this process because anybody in this room that knows Jesus as Savior and Lord, you understand that it is a process. How many of you can testify to the fact that you know more about God now than you did the day you got saved? Now, if you say, I don't know if I do or not, then you got an issue. God doesn't have it. Okay. Y'all bump elbows with somebody and take a seat. I think y'all stayed out too late watching fireworks. Should have got up early and drank some coffee or chewed it or something. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, happy day after Independence Day. <laughs> Are you glad you're in a free country? How about let's keep it that way? <laughs> now I get it. Look, I'm a Christian first. Then I'm an American. But we need to keep it free. Amen. So that, well, you know my heart. I ain't even going to go into all that. But let's just... Uh, Let's do what we should do as believers. Amen? First and foremost, we need to pray for an awakening. And don't make me come to your row to wake you up. Because I have been known to do that. We need to pray for an awakening in the church. This, this is a far different atmosphere than what was in here on Wednesday night. In fact, it's strangely different. In fact, I feel like I could be in another church. What happened? From Wednesday night when it was so loud from the worship of our God that you couldn't hear yourself think to this morning when I don't even, it's like, what is happening? What happened from Wednesday till now? I'm asking a fair question because nothing changed in my world from Wednesday to now to be passionate about God. 
Well, I was up late. Well, you should have went to bed early. I was up late and got up early. If we cannot have passion to worship our God in an environment like this, then I assure you, you won't worship him when it gets tough. Well, I don't know if I like that. Well, I didn't ask your opinion. Because it's the truth. If we can't honor God now, if we can't lift a hand to God now, if we can't verbalize our love for God now, I'm going to tell you something. When she tightens down, you won't be doing it then. Amen. We're starting a series today entitled Intimacy with God. Some of your lives can change if you'll let them. Some of your passion levels can rise if you'll let it. On Wednesday night, in case you weren't here, worship became so loud in the room that the praise team could not even continue. That's called shouting them down, if you don't know what that is. It was incredible. Well, what was, what was it? We were, we were opening our hearts up and honoring God. Do you know it should be like that literally in every service? He said, well, it's early morning. Well, come to the second service then if it takes you a while to wake up. I mean, right? I mean, you're here early, meaning you're early risers, meaning you ought to have it together already. <laughs> when I say intimacy, I mean like close familiarity or friendship, a closeness, like we know our God. Amen. Like we're close with our God. I don't mean like, I don't mean like when you get a close parking space at the mall and you're like, God is so good. God, I mean, you get out of the car, you're like, ah! It's like, what is wrong with those people? I got a parking space close. God loves me. It's like, everybody in the parking lot's like, and you're weird. I mean, it might do some of us good to park. <laughs> further away. No judgment, I'm just saying, when I go by myself, I park further away. Like, I just want to walk. I just want to enjoy the stroll to the door of Walmart. Because I know when I go through the door at Walmart help me Jesus I need a vision I need to see angels I'm going to pray in the spirit the whole time like help a brother would you I mean well I need the walk from the door back to the vehicle to cleanse my mind <laughs> so you know we need to get to know God in a very close way. How many of you know this? We enjoy God on the mountaintops. Oh, it's enjoyable. I mean, it's just like, ah, man, everything's great. The air's clean. I mean, everything's just wonderful up here. It's amazing. I mean, I love the mountains, like physical, like real. They're amazing. Mountains are incredible. A few years ago, Sue and I went out west on vacation. I'd been out there before working, and we went out there on vacation, and I said, babe, you are going to see mountains. She said, honey, I've seen mountains. I said, no, no, you haven't seen mountains. Yes, I've seen mountains. I've seen the Smoky Mountains. I said, you have seen molehills, but now you're about to see the Rockies. 
and the Grand Tetons. It's, it's, it's all inspiring, really, to witness God's creation like that. And it's so enjoyable. And it's so enjoyable when we are on that spiritual mountaintop where every decision you make is right and everything you do is right and every move you make is the right one. And it's like nothing can go wrong. And it's like we're just hanging out with God. It's like this is great, God. Remember when Jesus revealed himself and, and Peter's like, hey, let's just build tabernacles. We'll stay right here. And he's like, well, the real work's down there. Like you really get to know me off of here. So you may be in a mountaintop experience right now and everything, you just may think, man, it can't get any better than it is right now. Can I suggest to you that it actually can get better and it gets better when you're in a valley? Because you grow, it's a place where you can grow more fond of God's presence and power. Because I mean, we know on a mountain, you don't technically really need all of God's power unleashed in your life. I mean, you got it going on, right? How many of you ever seen people, you're like, man, they got it going on. They, I mean, they're, they're just hitting on all eight cylinders. <laughs> Everything's going perfect. And then you see their life kind of go down the mountain into the valley. Then you find out if they really had it going on. We enjoy God on the mountain, but we get to know God in the valley. The valley's where the battles are. You know, when David went out to fight Goliath, it was in a valley. When, when they had battles, it was in valleys. How many of you know a valley is a place of desperation, loneliness? I think some of you are in a valley right now. Now is when you'll get to know the true greatness of God. Now is when you need to draw very close to God. Now is when you get to sense the heartbeat of God in this valley, in this dark place. Psalm 84, uh, verse 5 through 7. I was preparing as I kept thinking about Canley. She teaches this in uh, the Freedom Conference. When, when you go through Life Group, she teaches on this uh, place, the Valley of Baca. And I thought, I may just have to tag Canley and just say, just come up here, just let it rip. And so I was thinking about all that and I thought, man, this place defines really what we should do as a believer. Psalm 84 verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Doesn't say blessed are those whose strength is in their self and they got it all figured out and you know they just do they just do it themselves. They're just a kind of a do-it-yourself person. No. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Their hearts are set on getting through that valley. Yes? Let me ask you this, and you don't have to raise your hand. If you're in a valley right now, is your heart set on the other side? Is your heart really set on the mountaintop? Or have you become a victim of the circumstance you're in? Their hearts are set on pilgrimage as they pass through. See, they've got the mindset of I'm going through this valley, the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping. They say that it could have been named that because of some of the trees that were in that valley. They, uh, sap would seep out of them all the time and they were known as weepers. The valley of weeping. Have you been in a valley of weeping? I'm just going to be honest. Some of you look like you're in a valley of weeping right in this moment. 
I mean, turn that frown upside down, would you? As they pass through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Now, in, in the New Living Translation, let's look at it in that. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord. This is how you can go through hard times and still be up here. This is how you can go through dry places and still be up here. This is how you can understand the scripture that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I, if you put your trust in the Lord and you understand where your strength comes from, then that's joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the city of refuge, the city of peace. Have you set your mind on a place of refuge? For he is my refuge. He is my shield. He is my buckler. Have you set your mind on that place of refuge? Have you set your mind on the Prince of Peace? Valleys were known as bad places. They were hard to get through without something bad happening. They were places where robbers would hide and steal from people and take things away and harm people. Valleys are rough. Would you agree? Valleys are dark. Valleys can be lonely. And when you get in a valley, you feel like there's no one else on earth but you. If you've ever battled depression, you feel like there's no one else in existence except you. That you're the only one having trouble. We're going to talk about a guy next week who thought he was the only one left doing anything for God. His name's Elijah. And he was in a wilderness. So maybe you're not in a valley. Maybe you're in a wilderness. If you want to get to know God intimately, it's in the times when everything isn't clicking is when you can really get to know God. How many of you know this? You start to find out who your friends are when things go sideways. Right? Like, I, I watch people and they get married and oh, it's just, oh, you know, it's the first little bit. And I mean, it's like everything is just, I mean, every day they wake up and birds are singing. I mean, it's like God's walking through their living room. Hallelujah. I mean, oh, and then one thing goes wrong. And it's like all the joy has left. God's not in this. I must have missed God. What is happening? Come on, dude. She burnt the toast. I mean, calm down. I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand what the problem is here. Like, get over it, okay? Like, you find out in a marriage, in those hard, tough moments, like, soon I've been married, it'd be 29 years this October, and I'm going to tell you something. We have had our share of valleys, our share of moments. And if you stay married long enough, you're going to have your share. Uh, where are the married people in this room? I, some of you are like, oh, no, it's all mountains. You're in a valley right now and can't even see it. I'm going to tell you that. You, you <laughs> Some of y'all sit at home going, nobody knows. <laughs> sing that under your breath. Don't sing it out loud. <laughs> or we'll all know the trouble you see. <laughs> Come on. Sue and I, you know, we got married. We were 
let's just say we didn't know Jesus. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, we were young. I mean, I was 20. She was 19. I mean, we were just children. That's been a minute. I didn't have any gray hair. I had more hair. It was awesome. And so just, but in those 29 years, I have found out, and so has she, who's going to be around when the dust settles? If I can depend on no one else in this room, I know who I can depend on. You see what I'm saying? Like, we need to understand that if the whole world walked away from you, God is still there. So I can depend on God when times are good and I can depend on God when times are bad because times can change. Times can be great. Times can be not so great. Things can be going wonderful and then things can be going not wonderful at all. Like you can be on a mountain one minute and the next minute, the next breath, you can be in a valley. You get a phone call and you're on the mountain and 10 seconds into the phone call, you realize I have just walked off the mountain into a valley and I don't know how long it's going to last. See, that's the thing about being in a valley, you don't really know how long it's going to take to get to the other end of this deal and get up on the mountain because you can't see the other end. That's why we have to trust the Lord and trust in his power and trust in his love, trust in his strength. Our strength is in him and we go from strength to strength when you're dependent on God. Amen. Yes. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. So if you're a Christ follower and you're going through a valley, you know that you can depend on the strength of God. If you're a casual Christ follower, then maybe you don't understand that you can trust in the strength of God. And if you're not a Christ follower, all you've got is what you've got. That's it. You have your own power, of which you've probably already found out is not enough. You have your own strength, of which you now realize is not enough. You have your own wisdom, which you now know is not enough. All you've got is what you've got. If you know God intimately, when you go into a valley, you know this is a time of growth. This is a time where I'll gain more strength. This is a time where I'll learn more about God. This is a time where I'll be more aware of the power of God. I'll become... Uh, I'll become more aware of his presence. And then if you're a casual, uh, as the average goes, like I go to church once a month, Christian. Like I hang out with other believers once in a while. Like I might read the Bible once a week. I mean, you know, if the pastor doesn't really read my favorite scripture, like I might open my Bible up this week and read it. If that's your view of being a Christian, then when you go through a valley, it's going to be tough. And when you watch people who are going through the valley, they may be weeping in that valley, but they're digging wells in that valley for God to fill. Amen. So you have to understand, it's... Uh, it's God's strength that we're dependent on. Come on, what did Paul say? Help me. I mean, he's like, Lord, do something. Get this away from me. People say, yeah, that was a sickness. No, it wasn't. It was, God explains what it was in the scripture. I just heard a sacred cow moo. I love it because we grill them and eat them. It was an angel of Satan sent to buffet him. And God said, don't worry about that. I'm giving you the paraphrase here, the West Kentucky version. Don't worry about that. My strength is enough for you. You just keep following me. My strength is enough for you. It may look bad right now, but my strength is enough for you. I know what you're going through is tough, Paul, but my strength is enough for you. I know what you're going through seems like it's going to be the end, but my grace, my power 
is sufficient for you in your weakness. So glory, and then from then on, Paul said, I glory in my weakness because I, now I know in my weakness, his strength is really made strong. So when you get in that dark place, you ought to be raising your hands and glorifying God, knowing his strength is made perfect in my weakness. I'm weak right now, but I know God is being strong on the inside of me. It's much better to depend on God's strength than it is your own. We can be very prideful in low places because here we think, oh, I'm fine. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Praise the Lord. Blessed and highly favored. I'm fine. Well, that wasn't what you posted. So I'm just trying to check and see if you're okay. I, I don't know. So what? I don't know, like, which is real? Was the gloom, despair, and agony on me post real? Or is your blessing highly, fa like, is this a faith statement and you're really not doing good at all? Come on, folks, we got to get to the heart of the matter. I don't need anybody's help, preacher. I can do it by myself. <laughs> okay. So you've taken God's seat now. Come on. I love how Pastor Wayne said, he said, pride is not spiking the football in the end zone like we think. Pride is doing it and leaving God out. Blessed are those whose minds are set on the Lord. The Apostle Paul was very strong at teaching on the mind. Set your thoughts. Set your mind. Put your mind on these things. Think on these things. Think on these. If it's good, think on it. If it's noble, think on it. Come on. Set your mind on things above. What was he talking about? Not the clouds in the sky. He was talking about heaven. Set your mind on things above, not the things on this earth. How many of you know things on this, on this earth have gone completely haywire? Now is the time we are to set our eyes on things above, not things on the earth. I get it, things on the earth are crazy. Things on the earth are bad. But if we set our mind on the things above, come on, we can get in faith, we can dig a well, and then we can change the things on the earth. But until we get our focus on God, we're just trying to do it in our own power. We already see how that's working. Come on, you got to make a well in a dry place. Even when life is going crazy, remember what David said in Psalm 23? Even though I walk through, notice the verbiage in these two passages of Scripture, going through and walking through. I'm going through this place. I, am, I refuse to, to pitch a tent and stay here. I'm going through. I'm walking through. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. In other words, I recognize you're here with me, God, and I will not fear what this valley has to offer because I know you're with me. In fact, I know you're with me so much that you're going to set a table in this valley before me in the presence of my enemies so that I'm going to be able to enjoy your greatness even in the presence of my enemies. You're going to anoint my head. My cup runs over. I mean, God, I got it so good. No matter where I'm at. No matter if I'm on the mountain or I'm in the valley. I'm going through the valley. And you're with me every step of the way. So you got to be able to recognize God even when you can't feel him. Even when you can't sense his presence. you got to know God's there and then become aware. See, I think instead of self-awareness, we need some God awareness in the church. We need some Holy Spirit power awareness in the church. We need to understand that God is in this room right now by the power of his Holy Spirit. We're not waiting on God to show up. We're not trying to talk God into showing up. We're not trying to shout loud enough to get God to be here. No, God is here. He came on the inside of you by a miracle of the Holy Spirit. God is everywhere you go. That's why it's important to watch where you go.
Come on, we show God our faith and God reveals his faithfulness. Remember the guy with the withered hand? Jesus walked up to him. What did he say? Hey, let me see your good hand. No, that's not what he said. Have you read the Bible? What did he say? What did he say? Some of y'all are like, I don't know what he said. Oh, it's a great, it's a great story of how Jesus pulled on a man's faith to see where he was at. He said, stretch forth your hand. His withered hand, his hand that was crippled, that he couldn't move. He said, stretch it forth. When he did, it was healed. The man had been crippled for 38 years laying by the pool. He said, take your mat and leave. Get up and walk. In other words, show me your faith. The miracle's waiting on it. See, this is what people don't understand. God's power is waiting on your faith. God, listen, we're not waiting on God to move. When you, when you already see the answer, and you're like, man, I mean, I believe God. No, that's not believing God at all. It's already happened. Believe in God and standing on the word of God and confessing the word of God, even in the valley, knowing God is there with you. God's working on my behalf and this valley is going to turn into a mountain someday. I don't know what day. I don't know what time. All I know is, is God is faithful. I'm going to show God my faith. God's going to show me his faithfulness and my withered place is going to become a place of strength because I go from strength to strength and God is my strength. God is my refuge and I'm going to the mountain. Amen. I started to say head of the mountains, but some of y'all would have took that wrong. <laughs> some of you are like, what? Good. If you don't know, don't worry. I'm not going to explain it. Some of y'all are like, I know what you're talking about, preacher. I know. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the mountain I'm talking about. <laughs> we got to prepare for the presence of God. This is why that we continually say, be ready for worship when you get here. Don't wait until the third song to kind of get your groove on. Huh? Don't be waiting on a goose bump to know if God's here. Ooh, God was here, preacher. I'm like, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I, I knew he'd come in the room when I felt the goose bump run up my left shoulder blade. That's how I know, that's how I know. You're weird. Now, you may get a goose bump. But just because you got a goose bump didn't mean that's when God walked in the room. God was in the room when you walked in. And you need to prepare yourself for worship. See, that's what happened Wednesday night. People were prepared. And when worship started, they weren't waiting on this bunch up here to get them worked up. They were already in the presence of God. Amen. So I'm just suggesting maybe listen to worship music at least on the way to church. I mean, if you're pulling in the parking lot, I'm on the highway, you know, that's bad. That's bad. You, you need to change CDs. You, you need. Is that really that important? I said, yeah, it's very important. Go, there's a preacher, turn it down, turn it down. <laughs> Draw near to God and he will what? So we have a part to play. We draw near to God, God draws near to us. Be still and know that I am God. God typically doesn't reveal great revelation to people when they're in a blind rush. I'm not saying he can't. I'm saying typically he doesn't. It's when we get still and 
recognize God. Those moments when you recognize the power of God and honor Him in those moments that you get more intimate with God. How many of you know that before uh, COVID hit and people ran in terror we were on a mountain you would have had trouble finding a seat but there's a lot of spiritual knee knocking going on in the body of Christ. It's a plague. It's a disease. No, it's a virus. And I'm not saying it's not real. But I've watched this room electric with praise when we would command incurable diseases to bow its knee at the name of Jesus. Watch those people be miraculously healed. It's funny how the media can drive people into a valley. But here's what I know. In the valley, in the darkness, he is the light. In, in the scary place, in the weak place, he is our strength. And when I can't see the way out of the valley, I know who the way is. So we're going to carry on and continue on. We're going to do what we do. and We're going to believe God. And I'm praying, I'm asking God, and I would love it if you would do the same. I'm asking God for an awakening in his church that Christian people, regardless of what's over the door, would wake up to his power and to his glory. No matter where they say, I mean, come on, if you're more non-denominational than you are Christian, there's a problem. If you're more Baptist than you are a Christian, there's a problem. If you're, more, if you're more Methodist than you are a Christian, there's a problem. And I'll just be real honest. If you're more American than you are a Christian, there's a problem. No, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I'm a Jesus man. Before I'm anything else, I just so happen to pastor an interdenominational church. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a Christian because I would preach just like I'm preaching right now no matter what they hung over the door out front. It would make no difference because this is the word of God. This is not some man's idea. We must learn to praise and acknowledge him in the valley. And then when we get on the mountain, we're going to enjoy him way more. Amen. I've gotten to know Sue when we went through valleys in ways I did not know her. And it made the mountain far more pleasurable. Because I knew strengths about her that I didn't know existed. And it's vice versa the same way around. Well, that's my story. I'm going to tell it like that. I mean, we just say, just say it that way. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I found out things about her I didn't know existed when we went through a valley. And how many of you know sometimes when you're in a valley, you're thinking, is this ever going to end? Is this ever going to go away? Am I ever going to feel like I used to feel? Like am I ever going to, I, you know, I mean, come on, let's be honest. I mean, you've been in, had times and periods of your life where you thought, man, I can't even make a wrong decision. And then you get in a valley and you're like, I can't make a decision. What do you want for supper? I don't know. I don't know. 
I'm fasting. <laughs> right? I mean, you can't, you can't come up with anything. And then you pray, you're like, God, help. I just want to feel like me again. Come on. <laughs> Please tell me somebody else has prayed that way. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm telling you, I've prayed. I've been like, you like, Pastor, you, you pray. I mean, uh, yeah. I've been through valleys. I'm like, I got to come up. I got to get before God. I got to go preach. I got to tell people something good that's going to encourage them. I don't even care. Then you go before God and you're like, what do you want them to hear? Because I don't feel good. This is a dark place. Why, God, why? I mean, you know, come on, y'all pray that way. <laughs> God, are you even real? There's some Christians that pray that way. God, are you real? Are you out there? Do you even exist? Boy, you're in a valley. Come on, it's dark, man. I mean, like. No, we got to understand he is there. And that there's things in us now we'll find that we did not know existed. Strengths and weaknesses. And those weaknesses that we discover in that valley, God, you and your strength are made perfect in my weakness. And I thank you that even though I'm in this valley, I know I'm going through it. And someday, we'll just be laughing about it on the mountain. I know this. I'm closing with this. I know this from my own experience. And I can guarantee you there are plenty of people in this room that would, that would testify to the same thing. That when I've got on the mountain after I've come through a valley... And I look back at the valley. It's not near as deep as I thought. It wasn't near as dark as I thought it was. There really wasn't as many wild animals trying to eat me in there as I thought. That really wasn't that big of a deal at all. But the enemy made it seem that way. Then, when you get up on the mountain, what happens now? You look back down there where you had success and you go from strength to strength. From faith to faith. You grow and then when you get on the mountaintop to evaluate what happened, because you know, how many of you know if you've been in a fight, you kind of, after it's over with, you're like, man, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I, I'm, I mean, I'm going tell you, I'm good. And then about 20 minutes later, you're like, what happened? What are you doing now? You're evaluating the damage. See, we get on the mountaintop, we can evaluate what went on. Because you think a little more clear when you're up there. Then you start to look over I'm telling you, folks, I've looked over some valleys in my life while I was on the mountain and think, okay, that was a bad decision. The next one I go through, I need to steer clear of making that decision again, reacting that way. Come on now. You learn a lot through that valley about yourself you didn't really know existed. <laughs> Amen. Come on, bow your heads. Father, thank you so much that you are with us no matter where our location is. In the valley, on the mountain, halfway up the mountain going up or halfway down the mountain going down, you're right there with us. And I'm asking you, Lord, and I'm believing you 
that we get a greater awareness of your presence and your power. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Amen, give God a hand clap. I tell you, those valleys can be, like he was saying, really, really dark, really, really grim, but I'm so, so thankful that when you have people around you that help you get up out of those val valleys, it does make the mountaintop so much more enjoyable because you have people around you that have helped you grow and become stronger. Amen. I know I've been through some valleys and I couldn't have come out of them without God and the people that I put around me. Amen. It's important who you put around you. Listen, I'm so glad that you all came and you're here with us. Um, I'm so glad that you all joined us online today. Um, if you prayed that prayer uh, for to receive salvation, or maybe you're here for the very first time and um, you haven't been or you haven't been here in a long time, we have some information that we'd like to get to you and there's a number that you can text. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, you can text the word welcome to the phone number that you see on the screen and um, we'll get some information to you. Or if you made the decision to follow Christ or give your life back to Christ uh, today, you can text the word decision to that number and we'll make sure that you get the help that you need to get you where you need to be in life. Amen. Amen. Listen, it's our time of service where we get to worship Him and our tithe and our offering. The Word of God says, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. It says, Try me. Test me. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. And it not only talks about just a blessing, but so much that you won't even have room to contain it. And I was just discussing with someone on the phone this last weekend, or I guess this weekend, it was early in the weekend, but um, I was discussing with her, we were talking about um, the, the importance of tithing and the importance of being in covenant with God. And we were talking about my mom. And one thing my mom knew was the importance of tithing. And my mom could argue a point. And let me tell you, she would argue that point. She would tell you, I can't afford not to tithe. And my mom was on such a tight, fixed income. But she knew the importance of that tithe and making sure that was done. And all the way right up until she passed away and I was taking care of her stuff, she would tell me, now you make sure that's the first check you write. You make sure that's the first thing we do. It was important to her because she knew that she'd always have more than enough. And she had people argue that. And she had people argue the fact that sometimes they were giving her a little bit of money to help sustain her. But my argument back was, did she ever ask you? No. Well, it sounds like to me God used you to always make sure she had more than enough. See, it may come in ways that just don't seem natural. But God will always make sure that you have more than enough. Amen. So if you're out there and you want to give, there's a number on the screen and you can do that. And I just want to take the time to bless your tithe and your giving. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for each and every tither, each and every giver. I thank you, Father God, that as we get in covenant with you, you do exactly what you said you would do. You are not a man that you would lie and you will not break the covenant. And so, Father God, we get in covenant with you today. And I, right now, speak your blessing over each and every tither, each and every giver. And I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they'll always have more than enough. And I give you praise for that today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we want to say thank you for those of you all who have been watching online. We're so glad that you joined us today. And we hope that one day soon we'll get to see you right here with us. Amen. We love you all.